Yes, it's ready. Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, sorry for the delay and good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to the second edition of Cogito 137's Nobel in Focus, a series where experts explain the science behind the discoveries that were honored with what is considered to be one of the greatest honors in science. I am Isha Bhagwat from ISA Kolkata, along with my senior Aishwarya Balakrishnan, who will act as the moderator. And we have with us today our guest speaker, Dr. Poonam Thakur. A warm welcome to you, Dr. Thakur. It is an honor to have you here. Dr. Thakur is an assistant professor in the School of Biology in Aizar Tiruvananthapuram. And her research work allow, uh, revolves around understanding neuroscience and neurodegenerative diseases, in particular, the Parkinson's disease. Uh, over to you, Dr. Thakur. We are excited to hear you speak. Uh, thanks a lot, Isha, for your kind introduction. And I'm really um, excited to be here today. And I, uh, it's really a fantastic thing to talk about all this uh, work in the field that has led to um, this Nobel Prize this year. And uh, another enthusiastic for ion channels and this kind of work. Uh, it gave me immense happiness to see this prize coming. And I'll try to take you all through a journey and as I was told, this is meant for a general audience. So I have kept my talk uh, extremely basic. Um, but um, feel free to interrupt me anytime if there are any questions or if uh, you would like me to explain something in more detail at any point. Okay. So let me start sharing my screen. So my slides are visible? Yes, they are. All right, perfect. So, uh, you know, this year's Nobel Prize has come to uh, somato sensation in some ways. So this is one of our uh, basic senses that we have. And our senses are extremely important for us to sense our environment. We are embedded in our, in our environment and it affects all aspects of our life. So we use our senses to tell what time of the day it is or if this food is salty or sweet, or if you are sitting or standing and so on. And we do this uh, with help of these uh, basic sense organs or sense uh, that we have uh, that everyone learns in their school already. So smell allows us to see, you know, if, odor, if some odor is repulsive or attractive, taste lets us decide if a food is edible or not. We touch things to see. Uh, the pressure and feel the texture, our eyes or vision allows us to see the world around us and our ears allow us to hear things in our surrounding. So all of this, um, all of these are very, very complex sensory phenomena. So for each of these things to happen, our eyes, for example, need to convert the photons of light uh, and detect them and send the signal to the brain. Our ears have to convert the changes in the air pressure around us and send it to the brain. Our nose allows us to distinguish between all the odorants that are present. And our skin allows us to sense the texture or pressure being felt on it. And our taste senses allow us to detect the various chemicals to sense the taste of the food. However, these are various different kinds of input stimulus. But the brain is composed of these cells, which we call as neurons. And these neurons talk to each other in the language of electricity. So neurons talk, uh, can uh, conduct these signals, as you can see in these cartoons, and then meet another neighboring neuron and send this electrical signal onwards. If you stick an electrode inside these neurons, you can actually even measure these changes in voltage. They are, they are extremely small in size. So you need a very specialized equipment to do that. And some of these equipment has also been used by this year's Nobel Prize winners um, in their work. And they'll discuss a little bit more later. So the question is, when brain and uh, its cells can talk to each other only in the language of electricity, how is it that all this diverse stimulus get converted into electricity so it can be processed by the brain, right? So for this to happen, all of these sense organs contain highly specialized neurons, which have the ability to detect these kind of stimulus 
and convert them into electrical signals later on. And these electrical signals can then be processed by the brain and information be processed in that way. And because these are extremely complex processes and their study is even more complex, no wonder Nobel Committee has always been favorable to those who have uh, identified these phenomena. And uh, as early as 1944, Nobel Prize was awarded to the scientists who deciphered that you know some neurons are responsible for detecting pain or distinguishing between painful and non-painful touches. Um, in 1961, the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded for, uh, for the scientists who deciphered hearing and how cochlea uh, work to decipher these pressure changes. In 1967, soon after uh, detection, uh, elucidation of vision was awarded with another Nobel Prize. And in 2004, a Nobel Prize was awarded for uh, the work on odor and detection, etc. So, uh, by the way, taste of uh, a sense of taste is still up for grabs. So, in case anyone else wants to win the prize, uh, so the most recent Nobel Prize was given to Adam Petaputian and David Julius for their discoveries of receptors for temperature and touch. And what does this actually mean? So, before I go and explain their work in um, a uh, bit more detail, uh, let us talk a little bit about what is the sense of touch. Now, uh, we all know we are touching things in our uh, surroundings. And uh, when we categorize it neuroscientifically, we call it as a somatosensory system. So this system allows not, a, not uh, just to detect touch, but also if the objects we are touching, we can also sense their temperatures. We can tell if they are warm or cold. We can also sense pain. So if our hand is injured, we can say it is, uh, it is in pain. It also allows us to determine where our body is positioned. So you will know if you are standing or sitting, if you are leaning or not. And also a sense of movement uh, of your own body, which is extremely important. And this somatosensory system, although it is put under a single sense of touch, it actually integrates a lot of various signals and does a lot of multiple things as we just saw. So it not just tells the presence or absence of a signal, for example, if you're touching something or not touching, you're also feeling the gradient of that signal that if that touch is, you know, uh, firm or is that touch very light touch. And in case you're doing a handshake and you have an injury on your hand, so that handshake which was not painful earlier will now be painful so all of these various modalities can also be integrated by this somatosensory system giving it a lot of uh, information and signaling uh, power and this is important not just to detect our environment but also our own internal processes for example uh, changes in blood pressure so that blood flow can be regulated in various areas is also a function of this uh, how our respiration has to happen, our contraction and um, of diaphragm, etc., or your urge to urinate because when your bladder is full. So all of this sensing happens via this system. <clears throat> and because this system has to do a lot of jobs, no wonder it is not located in a single organ uh, like vision or hearing. In fact, it is spread over everywhere in all the parts of the body. For, uh, for example, throughout the skin and in a lot of our muscles. And so because most of these organs are located in the skin, uh, this is a diagram from a textbook and it just shows that our skin can feel a lot of various kinds of touches. For example, cold, touch of a feather, warmth of the sun, a prick of a needle or a pinching of a hand. And there are lots of these specialized neurons which are present in these areas, uh, which can carry these various signals separately. Okay. And for a while it was known, which was one of the early Nobel Prizes, uh, it was clear that there are some neurons which are called as nociceptors or detectors of pain, which are specialized to carry out the pain signaling. Okay. Uh, but the question is that, the pain is not really a chemical signal per se, or how, how do neurons uh, detect this pain and convert it into, into electrical signal? 
or how do these neurons convert temperature or touches into an electrical signal so uh, for this uh, there is some processes that are involved and so there are these specialized neurons which are uh, responsible for detecting pain these are located in various parts of the skin and all of these uh, they have their cell bodies uh, which are located in this area called as dorsal root ganglia and this send its some of its branches or projections into the spinal cord and from spinal cord they go into various areas of brain where the signals are processed okay so this dorsal root ganglia is going to be important for some of the upcoming studies here so this is David Julius. He's a professor at University of California, San Francisco. And what he was interested uh, in uh, starting of his career was uh, various uh, plant compounds or natural derivatives from plants, which have some biological activity and how they can be harnessed in neuropharmacology or like, you know, how some drugs or some various things can be uh, harvested from them that can be used for these purposes. In addition, he was also interested in determining our senses and our, how our senses make sense of our environment. So two of these interests of his combined for his work. And he got more interested and drawn into capsaicin, which is the active molecule from chili peppers. And this is the molecule that allows chili peppers their a uh, hugely uh, sharp taste or that feeling of pain when you uh, have them. So if you consume a chili pepper, what was known at the time when he began his work was that they could depolarize the neurons or the nerve fibers. That means they could uh, make these neurons conduct some electrical signals. And the question that David Julius was interested in addressing was, uh, does this capsaicin bind to any of the specific receptors in these neurons? And if it does, then what do these receptors look like? And do these receptors have any role in painful sensations because capsaicin elicits pain in our body? Okay. And so to address these questions, we what he started with was he prepared, he took some of these dorsal root ganglia from uh, rodents and he isolated all the genes from them. So uh, he removed all the mRNA, which codes for all the genes that are being expressed in these cells. And then he prepared complementary DNA libraries of these, uh, uh, of all of these genes. And then what he did was divide them into a lot of pools because a single, uh, because these neurons can express large number of genes. So he took some of these uh, various pools and started to express them in these hex cells, which are derived from kidney of monkeys. And uh, these cells are known that they do not respond to capsaicin on its own. And what he decided to identify that receptor for capsaicin was that he will start expressing uh, all of these genes that are isolated from dorsal root ganglia and express them into these hex cells uh, and try to find out if expressing some of these genes would confer sensitivity to capsaicin into these cells. And this is uh, this was one clever and lucky approach that David Julius did, unlike his contemporaries, because he started to use capsaicin itself to isolate the receptors. So this is the landmark paper from him, uh, one of the seminal works where he has identified this receptor and how he started was. So these are the pictures of these hexes that he has. And he is expressing some of the clones and then trying to see the response. So if a neuron, if these cells are getting depolarized, what will happen is if the receptor is present and it is opening, it will allow the entry of positively charged calcium ions inside. And this calcium can be detected with the help of some fluorescent dyes, such as Fura2. And interestingly, even discoverer of Fura2 also got Nobel Prize. So a lot of discoveries are really interlinked. So one of the pools that he had for the, from his DNA library, uh, they saw that there were these cells which, were, uh, which had calcium activity. So that means these cells became responsive to capsaicin now. And this pool was a mixture of several genes. So what they started to do was now uh, take, uh, take apart all of these genes and start expressing them one by one in more cells. 
and they finally ended up with one of the pools, uh, one of the genes, which expression would light up the end, all of the cells here like this. So that means this, this gene was the one that encoded the receptor for capsaicin. So the, if you express these uh, receptors in these cells, they would become responsive to capsaicin, which they were not earlier. And this, this what they did uh, later was to measure how this all is happening. They, they finally cloned this gene. They expressed them in uh, some other cells, oocytes, and then they measured the electricity that is passing through them. And then they could really quantify all of these results, all of these currents that are passing through. And then they could see that there is a large current that is elicited by capsaicin in this receptor. In fact, they, they then started to look for various other compounds which are in the family of veniloids because capsaicin belong to family of compounds called as veniloids. And many other chili peppers and their extracts, active extracts, were also showing this kind of activity. Uh, but what they were puzzled by is like, why would there exist a receptor for capsaicin in our body? And what else does it respond to? Because these compounds are not uh, usual. And why should a human body have, a, or a mammalian body have receptor for these kind of compounds? So it must be doing some other functions as well and must be responding to something else. And that is where they had to put in a lot of effort because they went through a large gamut of substances ranging from various neuropeptides or neurotransmitters. And because the search started from the pain thing, so they were really looking at anything that could elicit pain through these receptors. And after lots of trials, they ended up fire right so he did something that really is very painful if you end up burning your uh, any organ in your body right and what they did was then they tried uh, testing this out that they warmed the solution that was being supplied to these cells and then then saw that even in absence of capsaicin if you just provided heat to these cells expressing this uh, receptor they would light up like this and they could also see that uh, there was a, a temperature threshold for these receptors. So the channel would suddenly open and start conducting at around 42 degrees Celsius, centigrade temperature, which is roughly the temperature when the warmth and coziness of the heat starts to become uncomfortable and painful to us. And in retrospect, this makes sense because we often describe the painful sensation that comes from chilies as uh, that, you know, it is burning your ma my mouth. So it is like heat, painful heat kind of sensation that these chili molecules um, activate in us. And uh, in retrospect, it is very clear, but it took them large amount of effort to find it out and then to really see if these are you know decisive receptors for this they what they did was they uh, prepared some knockouts of these uh, of these receptors in mouse so these mouse lack this capsaicin receptors and then they tried to do some of these tests if these mouse can still re respond to pain. This is a picture of a rat, uh, not mouse though, uh, but just that uh, to describe what they tested in these animals was. So if you elicit uh, any pain in these animals, for example, if you inject chili, a, a little bit of capsaicin into their paw, it becomes inflamed and painful to the animals. So what these animals will do is they will constantly lick that area to reduce that sense of pain or they are trying to nurse their injury. So what happened was that these animals in which this receptor was lacking, they did not show any of this paw licking response. So they did not feel any pain. So they, they did not care to nurse their injury and compared to the animals where this re receptor was still intact. And they also saw that if you expose these mouse to some heat, so if they are put in a plate like this and you can change that temperature so um, if it becomes uncomfortably hot they would start to make efforts to escape this arena or jump and uh, you know uh, be away from uh, wanting to escape the being burnt by this so if you see that as you start to increase the temperatures 
the latency that the time that they take to start jumping and wanting to escape from it is also considerably uh, decreased in these animals which uh, which uh, lack this receptor so it was very clear from uh, these studies that these mouse uh, if if their uh, receptors so this capsaicin receptor is responsive both for pain as well as heat and afterwards um, came in the work of adam petaputian as well as uh, david julius so they both actually independently discovered the receptors for cold because once the receptor for heat was discovered then they wanted to see because we also feel cold and uh, excessive cold is also painful so are there some other receptors or family of receptors that would respond to this cold stimulus and uh, here also they tried to take similar strategy as they took for detecting uh, the heat receptors or the pain receptors and what they did was they expressed uh, they found some genes and if they are expressed in these CHO cells, which would normally not express, they could confirm uh, uh, sensitivity to uh, this cold temperature and these cells would light up with calcium indicator dyes. So if you see here, these cells expressing these specific receptors, which are called as TRPM8, uh, when they are exposed to a solution of cold temperature, you can see large number of neurons responding, large number of these cells responding to this temperature. And uh, quite similar to the uh, TRPV1 receptors for capsaicin and for heat, these receptors also responded to menthol, which is a cooling substance. So when whenever we are in, uh, consuming anything with mint, we often have this cooling sensation. So it is because this receptor encodes both for uh, menthol sensitivity as well as low temperatures. And let me just show you this quick video. Uh, so they also did uh, this approach of trying to knock this receptor out of these animals. Okay. Um, yeah. So they uh, remove this receptor from the animals and see if they could uh, have differences in their sensitivity to cold. So this is a normal animal. There's this chamber which is hot, like warm, 30 degree in one side and 20 degree on one side. So 20 degrees is a bit too cold. So you see this rat avoids going to that cold area because it prefers the warmth, comfortable warmth of this chamber as like most of the mammals and humans do. But if you remove these receptors from these animals, you see this rat, it is unable to even detect the cold. So it will go into this chamber and would spend almost same time in both of these uh, different temperature chambers in comparison to the wild type animals. All right. So over the years then later on, large number of similar kind of receptors were detected, uh, which would respond to many of these compounds isolated from, you know, food items or plant products from around us. For example, there are special receptors for garlic, cinnamon, camphor, mint, uh, and all of these, etc. And pretty much this entire family of receptors also respond to specific temperature ranges that is there. So these actually act as molecular thermometers. So these receptors allow our body to detect various different temperatures. So they all get activated in different temperature range and send these signals to our brain and take appropriate action for each type of uh, stimulus that comes in. And next we will go to touch, which is the second half of the Nobel Prize after temperature. So what was also known uh, at that time was that there are some cells which would respond or that they would elicit some currents. Um, there are some cells uh, when they, they get any mechanical input. So here you can see a cell which is being recorded with a very specialized electrode here. And this is like another small probe which is coming and touching this cell. And uh, there are some cells which when touched uh, when touched can actually elicit currents and this is the work in which Adam Petaputium was uh, interested in he wanted to identify how our touch systems uh, can be you know 
how they work, what are the receptors for those. And this is his seminal paper, which identified these channels called as PSO1 and PSO2. And for this, they uh, work in the opposite approach compared to what Julius David did. So what they did was earlier was to take a cell line, which was not expressing these receptors and, and cause sensitivity to capsaicin or this temperature to them. Uh, but what Adam Peterputian did was he screened large number of various cell lines to find the cell line that actually would give measurable mechanical currents. So this is just a cartoon of the same picture that if you, you get this probe and it is coming and poking the cell in increments of one micrometer distance. Uh, so each step one micrometer, it becomes closer and closer. So it is pushing the cell harder and harder, but it is it goes only up to the point where uh, the cell would not rupture. And with increasing uh, pressure, you can see a larger and larger current being produced in these cells. And they settle down on neura 2A cell lines for this purpose, which was giving uh, stable currents. And what they did was then they took and looked at all the genes that are there present in the in this neura 2A cell line. And they went with a more targeted approach rather than searching from every single gene that is present in these cells. Then they went and looked for the uh, genes that would encode for the membrane spanning uh, proteins uh, which can be uh, uh, told by the, how many hydrophobic residues they have. And then they uh, narrowed it, their search down to 72 potential genes. And they also focus on all the genes uh, that whose function is not known or they do not have any uh, you know, family members which are as yet known. So once they uh, narrowed down to these 72 potential genes, what they started to do was they started to silence these genes one by one in these cells. And then they started to measure this current that was elicited by this mechanical probe here until they found a gene uh, which will made these cells non-responsive to this pressure. And then they found that there was only one uh, channel, uh, only one gene which encoded for uh, this uh, protein called as PSO1. Uh, if that was silenced, the cell would lose their capability to generate this current in response to mechanical stimulus. And in further subsequent follow-up studies, they could find that this is roughly how the structure of this PSO protein looks like. It is a very large protein and also very unusual in structure. So it is a transmembrane protein, but instead of being straight, you can see this lies in a dented form of the membrane. So it is in this cup shape and the way it detects the pressure is that if you uh, if there is a pressure somewhere on the membrane it gets pulled like this and this would lead this uh, pore area to come out and open it up and uh, this is a very very recent work actually it happened in last few years only and this is roughly a 3d model of how this channel looks like embedded in the membrane so you can see it is not a straight membrane in this case, but in, it has a groove which uh, works beautifully together to confer this uh, pressure sensitivity to these channels. And then they also wanted to see that, okay, if these uh, receptors respond to touches or pressures, uh, if these are knocked out from the mouse, what all functions they, these channels, uh, these uh, receptors are regulating. And then they found out that these mouse, if these receptors are knocked down, actually lose their ability to detect touch or respond to touch as much. So they did a large batch of tests in this. I will just show you a few. So this is like a, a, a little bit of a sharp plastic uh, thing. And if uh, you make your mouse, uh, transgenic mouse walk over this, if it, um, because it is sharp, it will be painful. So animal would immediately re uh, react and withdraw as you would if you end up putting your foot on a sharp thorn or a pin. And if these uh, receptors of PSO2 were knocked out, these animals would not respond to this painful stimulus unless it's very, very large. Uh, also, if they were touched with this cotton bud, uh, the, the typical response of these animals is, oh, something is touching me, I'm going to get back. Uh, but these piezo to knock out mouse or uh, would not respond to it as much as the wild type animals. 
and also they lost their ability to respond to motion or shaking so if these animals are put on a, a platform that is vibrating and they had a choice to stay on a still platform versus a vibrating platform and it would happen that uh, the uh, wild type mouse would prefer to remain on a stationary platform and spend much less time on a moving platform on the other hand these knockout animals would make no such distinction so they would spend equal time on moving and a stationary platform and they also tried to see if you stick test cello tape on the back of these mouse so they would feel oh there is something foreign and the efforts they would make to remove this tape from the back and these piezo to knockout mouse would also not make any such efforts so basically all the basic touches or sensing of the environment by touch was severely compromised in these animals um, and not just this the so this sense of touch or uh, proprioception this it is responsible for large number of factors right so it controls our pain responses urination respiration blood pressure etc so uh, they uh, one of the important thing is our sense of self so uh, how do we walk our sense of where our limbs are and in subsequent studies it was also shown as you can see in this video that these mouse actually even lose their ability to detect their own senses and because of that their motions are severely restricted as you can see here this uh, knockout mouse they are walking on this uh, beam here and their walking is so bad and so disorganized in comparison to the wild type mouse because they cannot feel where their limbs are or they cannot tell in their head the position of their body and this yeah and this is another video that shows them that if you take this knockout mouse mouse usually can hang very well on the things but these knockout mouse uh, would just fall down because they they lose their sense of balance and where their organs are on the other hand wild type mouse can stay hung on this beam for a long long time so overall these discoveries of uh, receptors for touch and temperature have led to very minor understanding of the nervous system we have come to realize that these receptors are uh, responsible for maintaining our core body temperature okay sorry about that for our core body temperature these also in infer us capability to have inflammatory pain because um, if, if you get some injury and you get inflammation you also feel uh, sometimes that area also feels hot right so these has a lot of medical applications for example in neuropathic pain or visceral pain etc and these are also very important for our protective reflexes so if we do not feel pain and if there is a problem with these receptors we won't be able to escape from a harmful stimulus or detect the presence of a harmful stimulus and a lot of uh, research is now being focused on developing drugs that can target these without causing any side effects etc to treat pain or chronic painful diseases uh, similarly a lot of these processes are uh, touch based receptors are involved in so many of body processes and it has been actually uh, subsequent research has shown that there is a population of african ancestry in which there is mutation in piezo2 and what uh, happens as a result is that their blood cells or rbcs are slightly dehydrated and uh, that means they are smaller in shape uh, however this also offers them protection from malarial parasites so so that cannot thrive in those rbcs and also there are some uh, uh, different mutations that cause uh, these problems similar to these mouse in humans that they cannot walk uh, if if they are you know if their eyes are closed or there is dim light because they uh, without the visual cues they do not have any sense of where their body organs are and so far wrongly or they have been classified as having movement disorders and people were always looking oh if there is a problem with their muscles or if, if there is some issue Uh, in some of their you know motor neurons but it actually turns out that some of them actually had mutations in this piezo2 genes so these fundamental discoveries that really started as uh, of interest to find out uh, the need to understand some basic processes actually end up having lot of medical applications as we can see now 
And I would like to end this presentation with these beautiful pictures of both these scientists celebrating their joy. So this is Adam Pedderputium. He he just put out this picture how in his Zoom uniform with, with a blazer on top, but shorts and slippers on bottom. And this is David Julius after announcement of his Nobel Prize. Uh, and he was rightfully uh, celebrated with a garland made of chili peppers. And uh, I will leave you with this beautiful quote from Adam Petaputian that, yeah, you hear a lot of people saying that I think you're going to win Nobel Prize, but you don't want to think about this because there are so many other scientists who deserve this and wanting to win is not good for your soul. So basically, the research you do is really for the joy of discovery. Uh, and with that, I'll end my talk and I welcome any questions you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thakur. And that was a fascinating presentation. And it was very detailed. It was really nice to see uh, all the diagrams explaining the receptors and how they detect the sensations of pain. Uh, Aishwarya, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, we have uh, two questions. And thank you, ma'am, for the wonderful talk. And I would like to present those questions. Uh, the first question is from uh, Shrujana Mohanty. And the question is, if the receptors for heat and coolness were activated at once, would their effect cancel each other out? Um, so usually uh, not because these receptors are likely present in separate set of neurons, right? So uh, you could have, uh, for example, in one hand hold a candle and in one hold hold an ice cube, but your body would or your brain would still be able to tell uh, that, you know, it, it is being heated up in one place and it is being cold in another place. Um, if these both of these stimulus are being presented in a very close vicinity to each other, uh, you would still be able to feel uh, both of these as a separate thing because different neurons carry these uh, receptors. And uh, if you remember this uh, diagram uh, from skin, that there are separate receptors for separate neurons for these things. I think you have addressed the question. And the next question by Aniket Sabar. The question is, how has the discovery of piezo 2 receptors influenced the development of prosthetics? Prosthetics. Uh, actually, this discovery is far more recent. Uh, it, it was uh, only in last 10 years or so that these receptors were first identified. And since then, uh, the, the identification of the structure has happened only in last five years with the help of cryo EM, etc. Um, and just very, very recently, uh, people have started to find out, oh, there are piezo mutants in humans. So that's really, really very recent work. I'm not aware of any work in prosthetics that has happened as subsequent to this discovery so far. But yeah, hopefully in future, there could be something related to that. Yeah, so that's it for the question. Okay, so uh, thank you, doctor. It was amazing to hear your talk and it was great to have you here with us. And with this, we conclude our uh, first episode of Nobel in Focus 2021. We'll return with another lecture on another discovery. So see you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.